Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, for some reason, he said that he couldn't understand either they wanted you, and um, I said, well, thank you for sharing, and... um. <laughs> You know, something that I've learned from sponsorship and being sponsored is that, you know, from working a fourth and a fifth step is that, that I get nervous and I get scared, and that's directly because of my ego and my pride. And this is one place where everything changed for me was at the Atlanta Men's Workshop. This is one place I don't have to be afraid. This is one place where I know I'm loved just for what I am, and that's just a drum. Um, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the chapter of Working With Others, it talks about life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is this bright spot of our lives. You know, I hear a lot of people in AA meetings talk about that there's um, sponsorship is never mentioned in the big book. It's all through my big book. Uh, it's all through the people that are associated with my recovery. <clears throat> and so I was going to you know, write up some things and have a nice little thing done. But, what I, you know, what I was taught and what, what, I, what I do is, is, is I, all I can do is share my experience, strength, and hope and, um, and my experience with sponsorship. So with that, uh, um, you know, I, I, when I came into Alcoholics and I was my first sponsor what was, was Bob H. And, um, and, and Ernie and Bob and everybody here, they, they knew him. And he loved me. He loved me from the bottom of his heart. And uh, I, I'd go to AA meetings at, at a treatment center, and I can remember I'd go in, no one would have anything to do with me. I had a ponytail, I had earrings, and, and I'd sit in the back seat and I'd just rock. And I wonder why nobody would have anything to do with me. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he said, how you doing, partner? And I can hear him saying that just as plain as day right now. And um, and, and we, we just we got together and... He didn't work. He, he didn't work things right out of this book like it says to. But he was what I needed at that time. I, I, I really do believe that. Um, then, then I went around and, and, and I know I, I worked with Bob Burdett for a long time. Bob got me in the book. Bob, Bob was also. <clears throat> oh, that's okay. Bob was also. Um, he, I, I was at the Revo's Club one day and he said, "You're going to the Atlanta Men's Workshop." And I said, "No, I said I, I don't think I want to go, Bob." He said, "No." He said it wasn't a question. He said, "You're going." He said, "Give me a dollar." And that's all the money I had. I gave him a buck, and and at that time I was <clears throat> I was sponsoring a a man named Bob S. and and Bob B was my sponsor. And you know, and I, I'm a pigeon, and I have pigeons. And uh, I had a a lady come up to me after meeting one time. She goes, "I just despise that term, pigeons." And I said, "The beauty part of that is that you don't have to use that word, ma'am." And um, because I do, it's what I was taught, and it's what I use. Uh, it's just the language out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that word may not be in there, but I know in reading the history of Alcoholics Anonymous that that Dr. Bob used a lot of slang terms. You know, and, and Dr. Bob in the good old timers it talks about how sometimes with a new drunk he called them cookies. Or when he talked to different people, he had slang terms, and, and, and I'm a lot like it. I use slang terms, and, and, and I carry the message to my sponsor, and, and, and he to me. Um, Bob and I came up here that weekend, and you know, I was 18 months sober, and I had my pigeon with me, and I was proud. And came into this meeting on Friday night, that the big meeting, people were hugging, and they were kissing, and I just wasn't feeling it. You know, and, and I went back to, to, to the room over yonder, and... and, and Came back over here knowing I had to, I had to help some alcoholic for me to feel better. And a lot of y'all know that story. There was a fellow in the back named Cliff L. who was sitting there sharing his brand of Alcoholics Anonymous with some people, and, and it was obvious he needed my assistance, so I just cut him off. <laughs> Shared my, my experience with him. You know how when you get done, you just kind of roll back and fold your arms, and you know, you wait for him to praise you. And, um, and I did that. And he just looked at me and kind of smiled. And he said, son, you're full of shit. Uh, it wasn't funny when he did it. Uh, <laughs> he hurt my feelings. And I told him later, I said, you know, I said, you really hurt my feelings. He said, it's not your feelings I care about. I care about you being sober. That was the second time somebody in this program started to love me. And they showed it by their actions. A lot of times the best things I've heard have been from people telling me stuff I didn't want to hear. Next morning we came to the magic and the power of the steps. First speaker that spoke was uh, Ron M. And when he got done, I leaned over to my pigeon, and I said, I feel sorry for the idiot that's got to speak next. Next person was Jimmy S. <laughs> when he got done, I leaned over to the person I, to, to, to Bob, and I said, I feel sorry for the fool that speaks last. He was Bill R. Uh, and when he got done, my pigeon took me out there by the, by the thing, and he said, you're fired. <laughs> 
Y'all laugh at all the wrong spots. I, I said, what do you mean? He said, because cause all the stuff that those guys were talking about, you ain't never said nothing to me about. And that's when it came to me I can't give away something I don't have. And slowly but surely, that's when my life changed. And whenever I share, I share that. And I share about the Atlanta Men's Workshop. Because, see, it got worse that time. What happened was the next day I went over to the third step meeting, and a guy quoted the third step prayer. So I sidled up to him, you know, and I had a piece of paper and a pen. I said, how about jotting that little ditty down? I'd like to take it home with me. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> he put his arm around me. He said, son, it's in the book. Um, and I started reading the book. And not just listening, you, you know, um, a lot of people say you've got to go to meetings. Don't drink and go to meetings. Don't drink and go to meetings. And that's true. But I believe, and it's my personal opinion, that there's a whole lot more to Alcoholics Anonymous than don't drink and go to meetings. I have to share my life with another man. I have to take these steps with another man. We have a thing that we copy from you people called a sponsorship tree. We have our own sponsorship tree that, you know, we love what you all do, and we take it back with us. And we have a thing where we all, whenever one of us in our sponsorship tree shares, we wear a tie. And we all wear ties in the group, you know, to, 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 to share with them. And um, I called my sponsor. I was going out of town to speak, and it was about two and a half hours. It was Thursday night. And um got off work, and about 7.30, I called my sponsor, and I was whining. You know how you do that sponsorship whine to your own sponsor. I was whining. And I told him, I said, it's the first time in my sobriety I've ever spoke that either you weren't with me or any of my boys were with me. He said, quit whining, you'll be all right. And um, you know how they share in that really spiritual way. And uh, so I hung up the phone, and, and, and I went on to the meeting and got up to the podium. And just, just as I started sharing, the back door swung open. Mose Nemo, Michael Donovan, and Robbie Downey came walking in with three-piece suits. That's sponsorship. Two and a half hours each way on, on a work night to come be with me. That's sponsorship. You can, money can't buy that. I looked all my life for that love and care and stuff like that, and I never found it. I found it through the boys and some of the boys I sponsor and the boys that they sponsor. Um, I, was, I was talking with, uh, I'm on my third sponsor now, and uh, I was sharing with my wife. He changed his phone number. And I was working in the camp, I was working for the railroad and I was stealing camp cars. And, and uh, he said, he told me one Sunday night, he said, I changed my phone number. And he just told it to me on the phone, I didn't write it down. I almost got on a, in a fight on the camp car that Wednesday night and I hauled to the phone. I always called him on Wednesday night. And I got there, and I picked up the phone, and I went to, to punch the stuff in. And I thought, damn, you know, daggone. I didn't write that number down. Put my fingers up there, and I just punched that number right in, and he answered the phone. You know, I went home, and, you know, being a good alcoholic I am, I had to brag about that to my wife. We were laying in bed, and I told her about that, and I puffed all up, and I said, I'm pretty proud about that. She said, yep. She said, do you remember when we lived in the crew when you were drinking and staying on the camp cars, and we moved to that, to that double-wide trailer over in Berkeley? I said, yeah. She said, you remember going to work that morning? We'd lived there for three weeks. You couldn't remember the phone number. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper and pinned it to your shirt. She said, you always were pretty sharp, honey. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You know, those are the things that, to, to me... Those are the things that I share. They're the things that have happened to me in, in, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that has always been given to me, you, you know, by another person. I, you know, it tells me in the book I've got to do the third step with another man. It tells me that I have to do those steps with, with another human being. Um, M- Michael D's in here. He, he's a young boy that I used to sponsor who, who is now a, a, a grandson. He, he's a... He's Robbie Fidget now. We kind of trade Michael off him. You know, we get tired of him. Um, he can only share so much, and um, he had shared enough. Um, and, and what happened was uh, my, my first sponsor had passed away. My, um, uh, I had moved on from my second sponsor. And I had been here for about two and a half years, and I thought, you know, I know the literature. I know the things I need to do, and I don't need to have that one person to share my life with. And I did that for two and a half years. Uh, I almost went crazy. I almost went crazy. And if it, it was from a boy that I sponsor that I went to, he t- Michael called me one night and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, what? You know, we met with him. And he told me, he said, you can't be my sponsor anymore because you don't believe in sponsorship. And I said, that's crazy. I said, I sponsor, you know, six, seven, eight guys at a time. I said, of course I believe in sponsorship. He said, no, you don't believe in sponsorship because you don't have a sponsor. And if you don't have a sponsor, you can't be mine. Who carried the message that day? I know that that boy carried the message to me that day. 
and they carry that message to me all the time. Uh, uh, t- today, you know, it, for somebody to take you into the, to, to their life, how many times have you gone with somebody and you do the third step prayer and then they get into the fourth and the fifth step and, and, and you know how your sponsor does you when, when you're done, when you get ready to do your fifth step and you've got that fourth step written down, you know, and, and I know what, what Burdette did with me, you know, I, I sat down, I had almost, I had my stuff written down just like it said to do, but I still hadn't made it, I hadn't made that decision, you know. I don't know if I'm going to tell it all. And he snatched it right out of my hand. And I was like, wait, you know, he said, yeah, you're done with it. And, um, and I like to do that to people when I do theirs. <laughs> I like to snatch it out of their hand and just watch them go crazy. And um, <laughs> as the promise is coming true, I, uh, <laughs> you got to give it back. And, um, but at these workshops today, you know, I got to share my life with, you know, when, when they get to share, and, and, and I know the fellow's not here, he won't mind me telling this, but he was doing his fifth step, and he got to a point where I literally thought he was going to hyperventilate. I mean, he was, he was, he did the deepest, darkest stuff, and he was just sucking wind in, and, 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 and I was just, and he was at that point, that point of talk, but that jumping off point, either with or without, and I saw him take that leap of faith, and he told his stuff, and it was like, God, that was powerful. God, that was powerful, because I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like, because I did that with a sponsor. You know, a man told me a long time ago, he said, you can't lead me back from someplace you ain't never been. You can't lead me back from someplace you ain't never been. And I can't share my experience and strength and hope with you if I don't have any. And where I learned that was right here at the Atlanta Men's Workshop. This place changed my whole life. It, it, it brought this book alive to me. It brought sponsorship alive to me. You know, how, how many people do you know with 15, 20, 30 years of sobriety that don't have a sponsor. The people I know that are like that all have a sponsor. They all talk about sponsorship. They talk about the importance of sponsorship. Um, I don't really know how much more that that, uh, that I can talk about. It means a lot to me. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous means a lot to me. Sponsorship means a lot to me. The people that, that uh, uh, a boy that I sponsor is, um, I was scheduled to be on a program to do this a year ago. <clears throat> and, I, and I wasn't able to do it because... My wife had a baby that day, you know, one of those little things. Uh, she had, uh, Zachary Eli McNally. And, and um, the godfather of that boy who was, you know, I'm going to get him a hat that says Made in AA. The godfather of that is, is a young man I sponsor, Robbie D. You know, uh, and, and I, you know, when we sponsor these guys, Michael, again, uh, my wife knows all the guys that I sponsor. She knows a lot of things about them. And, and, and she loves Michael and all those boys. But <laughs> Michael would call up, and Michael's very... He's very um, talented with a lot of different things. And he um, she, um, he called up one day, and I'd been turned down for a loan on a truck or a car or something like that. And he called up, and he said, Ms. McNally, he said, this is Mr. Uh, Whittle with a Cadillac. Mr. McNally's Cadillac's come in. She said, oh, no. She said, uh, he, he hasn't ordered any. Oh, oh, yes, it's here. And he was always doing something like that. <laughs> you know, one time I'd ordered a backhoe, and they delivered that. And she'd fall for it every time. And, and well, you know, they have those jobs for handicapped people call call all the time, you know. And this guy called. He said, we're selling light bulbs, and we'd like to bring them by. And, and I said, sure. I said, yeah, come on by. And I uh, got home. Cindy says, she said, that daggone Michael called, uh, called again this afternoon. I said, what? She said, he has something about being handicapped and some light bulb, and I told my tape of damn money to the door and come on by. It was really the people from the Johnson Handicap. <laughs> so, so sponsorship is. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, it, it means the world to me. Uh, when I got here, I, I, I didn't have anything when I got here. I didn't have anybody. And now I have a group of, of young men in my life today that, that, that share their life with me, and they allow me to share my life with them. And there's a love and a caring. And, 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 and you know, we just don't, um, we share it all, you know, with my sponsor and his sponsor. And, and then, you know, we don't, we keep, we keep track of each other. We know what's going on in each other's lives. And we don't just say what each other want to hear. You know, there's a lot of times that we get on each other. There's times that we call on the phone, and, and, and you know, what, what's that part in the big book and one of the back stories? It, it, uh, I think it's from A Vicious Cycle. That, that talks about the early times in Alcoholics Anonymous. The man says, you know, we took each other's inventory, and we took it on a regular basis. I'm glad to say in our sponsorship tree that we do carry that, that tradition, huh? <laughs> we take each other's inventories, and we take them off, and we do it because we love each other. We do it because we care about each other. And we do it because you people teach us one day at a time how to be sober. I thank you all for letting me share. And um, I'll turn it over to Dave now. Thank you very much. Thanks, JP. My name is Dave, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Dave. 
And by the grace of God, I am sober today, and I really mean that. Some days all I can say is that my name is Dave and I'm an alcoholic, and that's what I really need to be able to say. My home group is the New Hope group. Of a, I have two home groups. There's the New Hope Big Book Study and the New Hope Step Study in Marietta, Georgia. I don't know. I was, I was thinking of some stuff to say here. Evidently, there was this... Uh, man and wife that were having some marital difficulties and so they went to see a marriage counselor and one thing led to another and finally the marriage counselor said well I have a very personal question I need to ask you and do you mind answering it and he looked at her and she looked at him and they shook their heads and they said nodded their heads and so they said no go ahead and ask it he said okay well here's the question uh, do you have mutual climax and she looked at him, and he looked at her, and they shook their heads, and, and he spoke for her, and he said, no, we have mutual of Omaha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, try another one. <laughs> Maybe I should... <laughs> George. <laughs> There were these. There was this guy that was in the bar, and he was having a terrible, terrible time with himself and wrestling with a lot of guilt. And he finally decided that what he needed to do was unload it on somebody. And you know how we've all unloaded things with unsuspecting people in bars. And so he went to this guy and he said, uh, "I've got a terrible thing in my life, and I just need to tell somebody." And and the other drunk said, "Well, go ahead and say it." Well, I don't know if I can. It's just terrible. Well. Try it, and, try it and see. So he had another drink, and he said, okay, I'll tell you. I had sex with my, with my wife before we got married. Did you? The guy said, I don't know. What was her name? <laughs> that's, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> huh? let, me, let me, can I read a story? This comes out of The Song of the Bird by Anthony DeMello, and, and uh, Noel B. was the first one who introduced me to this. I want to read this story. It means a lot to me. It's called The Diamond. The sannyasi, which is like the guru of India, had reached the outskirts of the village and settled down under a tree for the night when a villager came running up to him and said, The stone, the stone, give me the precious stone. What stone? asked the sannyasi. Last night the Lord Shiva appeared to me in a dream, said the villager, and told me that if I went to the outskirts of the village at dusk, I would find a sannyasi who would give me a precious stone that would make me rich forever. The sannyasi rummaged in his bag and pulled out a stone. He probably meant this one, he said, as he handed the stone over to the villager. I found it on a forest path some days ago. You can certainly have it. The man gazed at the stone in wonder. It was a diamond, probably the largest diamond in the whole world, for it was as large as a person's head. He took the diamond and walked away. All night, he tossed about in bed, unable to sleep. The next day, he woke at the crack of dawn and ran to the sannyasi and said, Give me the wealth that makes it possible for you to give this diamond away so easily. Give me the wealth that makes it possible for you to give this diamond away so easily. The analogy there is a sponsor and a sponsored. Which one do you suppose is which? Who in here, I, I thought J, JP was going to ask this question. Who in here has a sponsor? Every hand, good. Who has two sponsors? Who uses their sponsor? All right, all right. And who in here is a sponsor? Hey, check that out. Man, you guys ought to be up here doing this instead of me. I, like JP said, I've come to the conclusion that sponsorship is one of the greatest gifts of this program. See, I was an isolator all my life. I didn't want people to know me. I didn't like people, and and people didn't like me. Uh, and when I came into this program, I found it very difficult to do anything except be the last one into the meeting and sit by the door, and the first one out as soon as the men at the end of the Lord's Prayer was said, and then beat my way on home and be done with it. So I didn't have to talk with anybody. Sponsorship has eased that problem enormously, and I just can't believe that I used to be that way. That's how much change has taken place in my life. You see, it says right behind us here, it says, we can do what I couldn't. And it's a we program, a we program. And we read it like the Chinese torture every AA meeting in the uh, preamble to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, and it says, it says, uh, uh, 
that we share our experience and strength and hope with each other. It doesn't say we take it home and sit on it like I wanted to do, but we share our experience, experience strength and hope with each other. For me, isolation or uh, sponsorship became the end of isolation. And what a wonderful gift that was. And it was tough for me, very, very difficult for me, to get into this business of learning to share with another person. First, let me let me mention something. Uh, JP said that the term sponsorship is not in the first 164 pages of the big book, and it's not. It doesn't appear anywhere. And I think the reason is because the uh, formalities of sponsorship hadn't been had uh, hadn't been worked out by that time. But in the 12 and 12, it's on. It's in every single step. The word sponsor appears in every single step, except six, seven, eight, and eleven. Other than that, it appears in every single step, even step 12. It's even in the 24-hour book. If you want to know about sponsorship in in one day, just one little paragraph, read the October 11th entry on the 24-hour book. It's all about sponsorship. AA has a whole pamphlet out about sponsorship and what it is and what it's all about. And I would urge people who, I used to sit up in here and read part of it, and I guess everybody can read, so I would urge people who are interested in the official AA position on sponsorship to get a hold of that pamphlet and read about sponsorship. And you will find that sponsorship really started uh, with, or is defined as one alcoholic sharing with another. It doesn't say that it's a boss and a coolie. It doesn't say that the sponsorship, that the sponsor is the dad and the sponsored is the little boy doesn't say any of that stuff. It says that they are two alcoholics sharing with each other, one of whom has considerably more experience in the program. And I fully support what J.P. was saying, that I can't share something that I don't have, and that means I darn well better get it first. But a sponsor is one alcoholic sharing with another. It, it got its name, evidently, from the history anyway, it got its name, evidently, from the recovering AA, the guy with a little bit of experience, sponsoring the sick person or the new person into the hospital. In order to be admitted to the hospital, they had to be signed in by somebody, and that was called a sponsor. And, of course, we commonly call it call it pigeon, so I did some work on that, tried to find out why it's called pigeon, because I don't like the word either. You know, I was just wondering why, why it's called pigeon. Evidently, it's because pigeons fly together, and as pigeons fly together, then they stay with the flock, and if one person or one pigeon leaves the flock, he loses the advantage of the of the wind and all the other kind of protective devices, and he's likely to go off and get lost and whatever and 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 die. But I really think the reason they call it pigeon is because pigeons sit on the statues of giants and shit all over them, and, and that's what happens with sponsor. How do you get a sponsor? You see, for me, getting a sponsor was the most difficult thing I think I've ever done in 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 uh, in recovery. I was thinking this afternoon that there's there's a lot of reasons for not wanting to get a sponsor. Number one is pride. You know, I can do this program alone. I can read. I've got a mind. I'm intelligent. And I can figure this thing out for myself. When I hear people say that they can figure it out for themselves, that I, I got to think of myself. And man, I wasn't wasn't capable of figuring out things for myself. My best thinking got me here and got me into a lot of trouble. So I think that pride is a, is a big, big stumbling block. Another big stumbling block, a huge stumbling block for me anyway, in addition to not wanting to get to accept guidance and, and instruction from anybody or, or anything like that, was the fear of self-disclosure. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. I had walls built up around me. We all have it. We all come in here with secrets that we hold, with private feelings, with shame and remorse and with fear and with walls built up around us. And for us to be told that we have to get a sponsor and start sharing things with that sponsor means that we have to make a little chink in the armor that we have spent so many years building up around us. It means that we have to admit things. Maybe that horrible thing about how we feel about things. And it's a scary, scary proposition. And the wise sponsor doesn't force it, but rather does some listening and just tries to find where there is a little chink in the armor and tries to pry, help the person pry it open a little bit. But that armor has to be pried open from the inside. It can't be pried open from the outside. Our feelings have to be re, have to remain private until we decide to share those feelings, until we can trust, until we find that the risks are worth, that it's worth taking the risks. 
I got sober in at the 8111 Club, and there was a big sign there, and the sign said, Do you have a sponsor? They even spelled it wrong. And so I decided I didn't want any part of that. And I was too proud and too dumb and too numb and so on to know what a sponsor was. And I wasn't going to ask anybody what a sponsor was. You know, I I knew that word perfectly well. And I certainly wasn't going to ask anybody. There was a a guy at the 8111 Club by the name of Tom Myers. I love to tell this story. If you've heard it before, I apologize. But I know some of you have not. A guy by the name of Tom Myers. And... He used to invite me to go to coffee after after meetings. I'd been sober a couple of weeks, and he was a real nice guy. And I thought, okay, well, I'll humor him and, and go once in a while. I didn't really want to, you understand, but, but I thought it would make him feel good if I did. And besides, nobody had invited me any place for a number of years. It was kind of nice to have somebody think I was okay, at least good enough to go have coffee with. So we did that, and I saw Bill Sanders give Tom Myers his one-year chip. I was two weeks sober. And I saw this guy stand up, and I couldn't believe it. Man, I was still working on a day-by-day sobriety. I still am today. But I was wondering how in the world anybody could stay sober for a month, let alone a year. And I saw Bill Sanders put this bronze medallion in Tom Meyer's hand. See, I had been invited for the first time. I had been invited to this birthday party. Tom told me to come to the, invited me to the birthday party, which in itself was very flattering because I hadn't been invited to any kind of a birthday party since my 40th, and I still don't know why. But nobody wanted anything to do with me after that, I guess. So when Tom invited me to the birthday party, I thought I was very flattered. So I saw Bill give Tom his one-year chip. I was working overseas at the time, and I was scheduled to fly back to Saudi Arabia. This was on a Thursday night. I was scheduled to fly back to Saudi Arabia a week from the next day, which meant I would have been 21 or 22 days sober. And I was scared to death. Here I was trying to get sober, trying to go one day without a drink, And I was going to fly all the way to Saudi Arabia, which is about a 26-hour trip, most of which was on on an airplane, and try to do it sober. I had done it dozens of times, because I used to work, I worked there for many years in Saudi Arabia, and I'd done it dozens of times. And I knew, uh, (laughs) when Robert was talking about those miniatures, I knew exactly what he was talking about, because they have those all over the airplanes, you know. And the girl pushes the cart up and down, and I order six miniatures and a couple bottles of wine, and... And then that takes care of me until I come to again, and and that's the way you, that's, that's how you pass your time on, on an airplane. I didn't know how I was going to get to Saudi Arabia sober. Tom had done some uh, quite a bit of flying, business trip flying, and he understood my predicament. And so he invited me to the Thursday night men's meeting. Told me to be sure to come to the Thursday night men's meeting the night before I was to leave. And I went there, and he was the discussion leader. And for some weird, weird reason, I still haven't been able to figure this out, the, the topic of the discussion was traveling sober. And at the end of that discussion, he came up to me, and he put his hand in mine and said, Dave, this it still chokes me up, and I've told this story so many times, I'm getting better at it. But he, um, he put his hand in mine, and he said, Dave, this may be a silly thing, but I want you to take this chip. And he put in my hand the very chip that Bill had given him the week before. He said, I want you to take this with you. It might help you stay sober if you know that some guy here in Atlanta managed to stay sober for a whole year. And I said, Tom, I can't possibly do that. You just got that. And he made me take it, and I took it. And I rubbed that thing till it was almost smooth. And I rubbed it, and I made it all the way to Saudi Arabia without a drink. Thanks to the faith that that one guy... Now, how many here in this room would be willing to give up their first one-year chip to a person like me that they had never seen before except at meetings in the hope, the very... uh, What what was my shot at staying sober going over there 21 days? 10%, something like that, 20%? In the hope that maybe I would stay sober. And and in this absolute certainty that they'd probably never see that chip again. And here he was. He loved me enough, loved sobriety enough, and loved this newcomer enough that he gave me what I would think is his absolute most treasured and prized possession in his whole life. And I took it with me. And when I came back after a year in Saudi Arabia, I gave it back to him. When I got to Saudi Arabia, I knew I had to get to a meeting, and I had some phone numbers. And so I called these phone numbers. 
And the first one, there was no answer. The second one, no answer. The third one, no answer. And the fourth one was outside of the oil camp, which is what I was familiar with. And I didn't really know for sure if anybody would be around. And so I let it ring and ring and ring. And probably after the ninth or tenth ring, uh, this gruff old voice picked up the phone and said, Hello! I was thinking, well, I wonder if I got the wrong number here or something. He sounded American. And I said, uh, is this uh, George? Yeah. And it turned out that it was a guy that I came to know is by the name of Cousin George. He called him Cousin George because of the way he talked at meetings. <laughs> and I said I needed to get to a meeting. He said, well, they're on in, in the oil camp, and I can't do anything right now because I have the packers here at my house. And he was packing up to leave the kingdom permanently and go back to the United States. Now, I don't know how many of you have done that, but I, I know that we did it once when we moved back to the States permanently. And when you have packers in your house overseas, you stay with them if you want everything to come back to the United States that you had lined up to be packed. Also, if you want it packed on time, you stay with them, because the minute you leave, things disappear, and the time schedule goes to pot. So, Cousin George said, how much time have you got in the program? Which is not something you normally ask, but I guess maybe you could kind of tell. And I said, well, this is day number 22, and I missed a meeting on the plane, you know, because I hadn't been to a meeting 24 hours. He said, where are you? And I told him, and he said, I'll be right there. The guy had never even seen, left the Packers, came to be sure I was okay and to be sure he knew where I was going to be at eight or at seven o'clock that evening and he came and picked me up and brought me to the meeting so I'd know where it was. See, those guys were sponsors and I consider Tom Meyer to be my very first sponsor and he's, he and I go back a long way now. Uh, when I got to Saudi Arabia, I, I didn't, I had never asked anybody to be my sponsor. And I started asking some questions. You know, how do you do the first step? What's the second step? I need to know more about the third step. And all these people were, were kept on saying, well, you need to ask your sponsor. Well, I don't have one. Well, you need to get one. And for weeks on end, they would say, you need to get a sponsor. So I finally took the plunge and asked somebody to be my sponsor. And much to my chagrin, she said no. She told me I needed to ask a guy. And so I asked a guy by the name of Jim Murphy if he would be my sponsor. And he said yes. I fully expected him to say no, and it was a big surprise to me. He said yes, and Jim Murphy taught me a lot of what I know in this program. He taught me, the, he, he came from New York City, and he likened the early days of sobriety, or the early years of sobriety, and J.L. and I were talking about this a little earlier, to building a skyscraper in New York City. And I don't know what the exact numbers are, but for every two or three stories that it comes out of the ground, they have to build a foundation one story deep. So if you have a 50-story building coming out of the ground in New York City, you're like 20 or 25 stories of foundation. And he said, Dave, the first year in this program, what you really need to do is build that foundation. Because you're building a skyscraper, and that skyscraper is going to come tumbling down if you don't have a foundation. And you don't have it. He said, tell me about your last drunk. And I couldn't. See, I, that last drunk of mine was so horrible, I decided I was going to forget that thing once and for all, and I was successful. It's amazing what the mind can do. And I was successful at forgetting that, at forgetting that drunk. And over a period of time, over a period of time, he managed to eke out of me. Between him and me together talking about it, he managed to eke out of me what the last drunk was like. Over a period of time, he managed to show me that every time I drank, I got into trouble. And every time I got into trouble, I drank. I had been drinking. And that the times when I wasn't drinking were times when I was the happiest and wasn't getting into trouble. And I never knew that. And I never knew that. And he showed me how to do the fourth step. And I did it. And he showed me, he told me he'd be willing to do the fifth step with me. And so I did it. Now, then his contract expired, and he had to move back to the United States, and I was left without a sponsor. And by that time, I had become dependent on a sponsor. I had become so dependent on this sponsor that I had to ask him which meeting to go to. And there was only one. I had to ask him if I should go to a meeting, and he told me that there are two times I need to go to a meeting. One of those times is when I want to, and the other is when I don't want to. And I, I do that to this day. There are very few times when I'm indifferent about going to a meeting. 
When I want to, I go. When I don't want to, I go. I don't recommend you wait as long as I waited. It was probably three months into the program before I got one. The 30-day chip says on it the time to call your sponsor is before and not after. And so from that, it kind of tells me that we, we ought to have a sponsor by, by uh, 30 days. Noel Burtonshaw used to say, find a sponsor and tell him everything. Find a sponsor and tell him everything. Take the chance of letting somebody get to know you. Find a sponsor and tell him everything. If you tell him a little piece of you, and then you find somebody else and tell them a little piece of you, and the third person and tell them a little piece of you, and then something comes up and you really need to talk it over with somebody, there isn't a person on the face of the earth who knows all of you, and so there isn't anybody that can give you any help. Pat W., who uh, is at the Hall Place in Woodstock, New York, or uh, Woodstock, uh, Georgia, uh, told me once about the fifth step that he had asked Bill Wilson, why do you have to do the fifth step? And Bill Wilson said, in addition to what's in the big book, he said that the reason is so there's somebody on the face of the earth who knows all about you. That's powerful stuff. There is somebody on the face of the earth. In fact, there are two people on the face of the earth now who know all about me. See, when Jim left, I got me another sponsor. And then when I left, I came back to Atlanta and I got me a sponsor who was Gene Stein, and he's my sponsor right here now to this present day. And he knows all about me, and Jim Murphy knows all about me. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wonderful to know that there's somebody on the face of the earth who knows all about me. I want to mention a couple of things about what a sponsor does. A spon- well, let me first of all say uh, what a sponsor is not. A sponsor is not a marriage counselor. <laughs> a sponsor is not a financier. A sponsor is not legal counsel. A sponsor is not uh, a shrink is not a doctor, not a lawyer. What a sponsor is, is a good friend. A sponsor does a very simple job. There are three jobs that a sponsor does. The more I think about it, the more I come to realize this. Job number one, the sponsor leads you through the steps. You know, I was talking with a guy tonight before before I came over here, and a guy for whom I have a great deal of respect, and we were talking about the steps. Now, I've done these steps. And now I'm getting deeper into them and deeper and deeper. And a sponsor will lead us through the steps at every level of depth that we go to. Second thing, a sponsor will love you. Remember Tom Myers? Remember Cousin George? I didn't know what love was. And if I'd thought that that was love, I'm not sure that I would have wanted anything to do with it. But a sponsor will love you until you can love yourself. A sponsor will be non-judgmental. A sponsor will accept you. Like nobody in the world has ever accepted you. A sponsor will love you no matter what. It's called unconditional. And the third thing, and the only other thing that a sponsor does, and I think this is the most important thing of all, is that the sponsor leads you to your higher power and leads you back to yourself. Sponsor leads you to your higher power and leads you back to yourself. And I think that's the most important thing. That's what my sponsors did for me, and that's what I try to do with the people that I sponsor. It means I have to, it means I have to know something about myself in order to be able to lead you back to yourself. It means that you have to slowly but surely find out who you are. And I can help the people that I sponsor find out who they are by not imposing me on them. You see, one of the problems with most of us is that our parents brought us up in the image of our parents. And we need to bring ourselves up in the image of ourselves and of God, and not in the image of our parents. And it's a very, very delicate issue, a very difficult thing to tackle. But I think that's, that's it's an extremely important thing. And when sponsors start telling us who we're supposed to be, then that's doing the same thing that parents were telling us, or at least doing the same thing that my parents were telling me, who I was supposed to be, never giving me a chance to be who I am. I like to say this, and this isn't original with me, but I like to say it, that a sponsor really needs needs to know four words, one non-word, and the numbers from 1 to 12. And then you'd be a good sponsor. If you sponsor somebody, just remember this, and it'll pull you out all kinds of difficulty. You need to know the word yes. You need to know no. You need to know wow. 
And then there's a noun word. You need to know, hmm. And occasionally you can use this word, really. And then if you know the numbers from 1 to 12, you see, whatever your sponsored person says to you, whatever your sponsoree says to you, on the telephone you do more listening than you do talking anyway, at least I, I do anyway, and then you can interject these words, yes, no, wow, and really, and that sort of thing, and, and a lot of hmms in there. And then when they're all finished, then you can pick a number from 1 to 12, tell them to work that step, and they'll be fine. And they'll, th they'll think you're absolutely wonderful. And it, I've, I've tried that on occasion, and it, and it does work. Ultimately, the job of a sponsor is to let the person go. Let the person become themselves. Work the program the way they need to work the program. And in so doing, you know the old thing that says when you love something, if you let it, then you have to let it go. And if it's supposed to be yours, it'll come back to you. And when we let a sponsored person go, I have found over the years anyway that when I let a sponsored person go, they never really go. But instead, they soar on their own wings. It's like pushing a bird out of the nest, and they soar on their own wings. And then they get people to sponsor on their own. And that's how we pass it on. But even more importantly than that, they come to know themselves, and they come to know God, and the sponsor gets closer to himself and, and closer to his higher power. And then the most amazing thing happens. And to me, this is the ultimate in sponsorship the sponsor starts asking the sponsored person what the sponsored person thinks about things. What do you think about this? I had a situation about three or four weeks ago, and it, and I needed some help on it, and my sponsor wasn't readily available. So I went to two of the people I sponsored and said, what do you think about this? And they each independently told me exactly what they thought, and they told me the same thing. And based on that, I was able to make my decision. And it was wonderful. We sponsor each other. We sponsor each other. So, on that little thing that I read in the very beginning, the diamond, we had a villager who asked the sannyasi to give the gift that made it possible for them to give the diamond. Do you suppose the sannyasi was the sponsor, or was the sannyasi the pigeon? I don't know. I just know that I'm so grateful for this program, I'm so grateful for the concept of sponsorship, so grateful for the approval and the ability and the capability of talking with other people without shame and without fear and without remorse and without the even remotest possibility that I'm going to be rejected because that will never happen with my sponsor. It will never happen with the people that I sponsor. And I am just absolutely grateful to be sober and glad to be here. And thank you very much for letting me share with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.